All right, here's how it works. Everybody's got to go. You name it, we've got it. Faster pussy cat kills, <laughs> delivers tons more than the opposition. Unladylike karate chops, ungentlemanly haymakers, spirited gymnastics, corrective table etiquette, sandbox jousting, or a muscle-bound cat wrestling with a roaring sports car that's intent upon squashing him like a grape. Bizarre kidney and chassis rattling chases. And for the first time on the screen, a haymaking, belly busting, karate chopping, judo flipping fight to end them all. Superwoman against man. The prize, life itself. Slashing, tackling, gouging, hacking, flipping, belting, smashing, and blasting. Muscle to muscle, bone to bone. For an incredible evening's entertainment, a film so totally satisfying, see Russ Meyer, faster pussy cat. Kill, kill. Oh, God, what did I just see? <laughs> Welcome back to GC8. I'm Eric. And I'm Johanna. This week we're doing... Faster Pussycat Kill Kill! Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. This is a kind of a departure from what we've been doing f for a while. But before we get to that, what have you been up to since last time? I have been catching up on Star Trek Discovery which I was hesitant to watch at first because I'm a huge fan of the original series and some of the later Star Trek series were really underwhelming. But I had heard from some trusted colleagues in the film department that at Dartmouth College that this series was worth checking out. And I binge watched the last seven episodes of the first season all in one sitting, which it's been a long time since I found a TV show that made it impossible to leave the couch. So highly recommend Star Trek Discovery. I have been watching The Tudors. <laughs> Historical drama is not something I dabble in too often, but it had been on my list to watch forever and it was getting ready to expire. So I figured <laughs> I'd better start binging it. Historical accuracy is not one of its fine points, but it's entertaining. I'll give it that. With that said, I'm ready to jump into this because we got a lot to talk about. Well, I don't think we can talk about Faster Pussycat without first talking about its director, Russ Meyer, who is a fixture in the exploitation cinema scene. He got his start as a cameraman in World War II for the 166th Signal Photo Company, which caught me by surprise. After getting his start there, apparently some apocryphal story is that his mother pawned her wedding ring in order to buy him a camera. <laughs> that he returned from the war and immediately went into making films that reflected the violence that he had seen in battle overseas. But he also dabbled in a genre that I had never heard of before called nudie cuties. <laughs> these these were films that were sort of harmless comedies and melodramas, the first of which was called The Immoral Mr. Tease. It's a film he made in 1959. It's a comedy about a man with x-ray vision that allows him to see through women's clothes so that they all appear naked to him. It cost $24,000 to make and grossed $1 million, which for that time is a pretty amazing swing. After that, he became known as the king of the nudies, but the market for this type of film dried up relatively quickly. He then switched to some more complex work. There are only a few people who are really notable that came out of directing nudie cuties that I know of. Russ Meyer is one of them. The other big name you hear a lot is Doris Wishman. And not a lot of people know it because he's done a lot to hide the fact. But his first film, Francis Ford Coppola, his first film was a nudie cutie. Really? I believe it was nude on the moon, but I'm not positive. <laughs> anyway, continue. Anyway, so he then attempted to make some very serious works. Uh, one of them was sort of like a female version of Tom Jones called Fanny Hill. But these films were not very successful. He also made a couple documentaries. 
then after discovering that he was not going to be the next Steinbeck of cinema, he switched into what is known as his Gothic period. The first film in this trio is called Mud Honey, which critics called a flawless piece of unintentional camp. He considered it a failure, but in retrospect, the film is actually considered quite interesting and worth studying. The second in this trio is Motor Psycho, 1965, and then Faster Pussycat. But before we dive into talking about those films, first, let's talk about what was happening in 1965. March 8th of 1965, the first wave of U.S. ground combat troops arrived in Vietnam. On April 5th, at the 37th Academy Awards, My Fair Lady won eight Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Best Director. My Fair Lady. (laughs) On April 14th, killers Richard Hickok and Perry Edward Smith were convicted of murdering four members of the Clutter family of Holcomb, Kansas. This was made famous by Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. It was a murder in the heartland, plains, and uh, really caught national attention. April 25th, teenage sniper Michael Clark killed three people, wounded others, shooting at cars from a hilltop along Highway 101, just south of Orcutt, California. Clark killed himself as police rushed to the hilltop. In May of 1965, Russ Meyer released the film Mud Honey. Not to be confused with the metal band Mud Honey, who take their name from it. August 12th, 1965, Russ Meyer released the film Motor Psycho. Not to be confused with the metal band Motor Psycho, who take their name from it. (laughs) It was a smash success, so he decided to do another one with three women this time. Now, I have watched Motor Psycho, and I want to say that I loved it. It features three juvenile delinquent types on motorbikes, and they are in the high desert of California, where they cause a lot of terror, sort of raping and killing their way around the countryside. And it's great. It occupies this interesting space between the juvenile delinquent films of the 50s and what would come later. The very next year after this, which I'll talk about when I get back to running down the years here, the biker craze would kick off. But this was sort of a proto biker film. There'd only been like a handful of films featuring motorcycles at all. McQueen's The Great Escape is one of the few that you can think of that happened before this film. After this film, there were almost 30 films between this film and the end of the 60s about bikers. And then, of course, in the early 70s, we had stuff like Easy Rider. These bikers are on very different kinds of their little Hondas. They're not like big Harleys. They are very menacing, though. It shows a disconnect with youth that sort of started to begin with Rebel Without a Cause, that we see in this a lot. You know, they've got their transistor radio playing the hip 60s music that that the kids were listening to. And then things take a really dark turn toward the end when there's only one of the three left and he is trying to fight off two other people and he's having Vietnam flashbacks. So already... It's looking like a PTSD story. And this is only a few months after major ground combat in Vietnam commenced by the U.S. So I found that very interesting. It also stars Haji, who will appear again in Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. And her acting is actually a little bit better in Motor Psycho than it is in Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. That's all I really wanted to say about it, except that It definitely makes a good pairing with Faster Pussycat Kill Kill and was often shown on a double bill with Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. So I highly recommend checking it out, especially if you like Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. Anyway, that's it for 65. Let's talk about 1966. In February, the Daily Express, London paper, declared 16-year-old Leslie Hornby a.k.a. Twiggy, 
the face of 66. Her rail-thin frame and androgynous looks rocketed her to fame as the world's first international supermodel. And by the end of the year, she had released a record and a line of clothing. And uh, despite criticisms uh, that continue to this day about starting an unrealistic body type expectation for women. In May of 1966, after 18 years of continuous production, the last Porsche 356 was sold. Porsche had been manufacturing this model since it started, and it, its last one sold in May. On May 18th, the 38th Academy Award ceremony was held in Santa Monica, California, and The Sound of Music won Best Picture. In July, British Motor Corporation, makers of the MG, merged with Jaguar and would be defunct very soon thereafter. By 1968, they were defunct. July 20th, Roger Corman's American International Pictures released The Wild Angels, co-written by Peter Bogdanovich, uncredited, and starring Peter Fonda, Nancy Sinatra, and Bruce Dern as Hell's Angels, terrorizing the California desert. It kicked off the biker film craze. So Russ Meyer was just a little too early because <laughs> this film is like Motor Psycho with Harleys. August 6th, Russ Meyer released Faster Pussycat Kill Kill, not to be confused with the metal band Faster Pussycat that takes their name from the film. The main three characters are portrayed by Haji is back and she plays Rosie, mm -hmm. Billy she was portrayed by Help Me Out. Lori Williams. And then the leader of the pack, Varla, portrayed by Tura Satana. Not to be confused with the metal band Tura Satana, which takes their name from her name. <laughs> so as you mentioned, the inspiration from the film came purely out of the success of Motor Psycho. Russ Meyer said, well, this was such a huge commercial hit. Why don't we just do the same thing again, but with women? And everyone thought this was a good idea. The film had a few original titles in the work before finally settling on its immortal title. The first draft was called The Leather Girls, which is a reference to a UK film called The Leather Boys, I think. Uh, which is sort of a, it sounds a lot like Motorcycle, actually, in its plot. Sort of a gang of guys wreaking havoc. Second draft of Pussycat was called The Man Killers, which is a little bit on the nose, so glad they didn't settle on that one. But eventually the sound guy, Richard Brummer, came up with its final title, which, of course, implies speed, sex, and violence. All the things you need to make a good exploitation film. When we talked about It the Terror from Beyond Space, I mentioned how It was part of a lot of films of the time that were called It. I wanted to mention that Pussycat was used in a lot of films around this time, starting with What's New Pussycat the previous year, which starred Ursula Andress. Then came this one, and then between this and the end of the decade, we got The Owl and the Pussycat, The Girl from Pussycat, 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 I Love You, The Tiger and the Pussycat, Pussycat Strikes Again, and the animated TV series Josie and the Pussycats. <laughs> <laughs> Russ Meyer developed the story. The screenplay was written by Jack Moran. One of the things I love about researching this film is discovering that all the people involved come from weird places that you wouldn't expect. I mean, learning that Russ Meyer had started off as a cameraman in World War II and then went into the sexploitation genre was fascinating. Likewise, learning that Jack Moran started as a child actor in 30-some major Hollywood studio pictures, including Gone with the Wind, where he plays Dr. Mead's son. So coming from there to become a B screenwriter for exploitation films, and then following his career as a screenwriter, went to work in PR for the Catholic Archdiocese of Chicago. Talk about a fascinating, multifaceted life. So screenplay by Jack Moran, Although it's worth noting that most of the best lines of the film are actually improvisations and additions made by Tura Satana herself. 
In fact, she is considered sort of a secondary collaborator with Russ Meyer, and the film is viewed as their joint project. She embellished a lot of the details about her character, did her own makeup, designed her own costume, decided that she was going to be a martial arts expert because Tura Satana was herself. But before I go on too far, Eric, do you want to help enlighten the audience as to what parts of Tura's life are legend and, and what do we actually know about this fascinating person? Tura Satana is a fascinating character, and I'm doing this strictly from my memory of stuff about her. All I have to look up is her full name, which is quite a mouthful, and the date of birth. She was born July 10th, 1938, in Hokkaido, Japan. Her full name was Tura Luna Pascual Yamaguchi. Her father was a Japanese actor in silent film and uh, of Filipino descent, and her mother was Native American and Scot, Scotch, I believe. And she was, her mother was a circus performer, so already <laughs> interesting parents. And then she spent some time in Japanese internment camp when they moved back to the U.S. She developed early. And she was quite the handful. <laughs> Pardon the pun. She was actually two hands full um, <laughs> for both of her parents. And so they sent her to reform school where she allegedly started a girl gang and ran away. And then so they figured the best way to deal with her was to marry her off at 12 years old to a man named John Satana. You might think that Satana was a stage name. No, it was her married name, which was the <laughs> only thing she kept when she ran away from that marriage. So she kept the last name and was Tura Satana. A very interesting part of her history, which may or may not be true, is that supposedly just before her 10th birthday, she was raped, gang raped by five men, which convinced her to learn Aikido, karate, and I believe jujitsu also. And none of the men who raped her or allegedly raped her were sentenced. And she vowed to hunt them all down and claims that within 15 years, she had hunted all five of them down and, quote, made them pay. Don't know what that means. She never elaborated on what that was. OK, she arrived in Hollywood at age 15 with a fake ID, started as a burlesque dancer. She also was a bit of a music groupie, had flings with Frank Sinatra, allegedly, with Elvis, allegedly. In fact, there's rumors of a proposed marriage, which she claims she kept the engagement ring from, although she turned him down. She also claims to have taught him how to dance or helped him with dancing. In particular, she likes to claim or had liked to claim some responsibility for the infamous pelvic moves that he did. And given her background as an exotic dancer, I kind of believe her on that one. Yeah, I agree. I, I'd give her that one. <laughs> so eventually she gets involved in making exploitation films with Russ Meyer, who had been a Playboy photographer. She had done some, like a lot of uh, exotic dancers at the time, also did modeling. What I heard is that one of the modeling gigs she had was for pinup photos to be used in a film that Harold Lloyd was involved in. And that they struck up some sort of friendship. And ultimately, he was the one who encouraged her to go into show business. He said, the camera loves your face. You should be seen. And that gave her the confidence to start auditioning for films and head into that direction. Right. Thanks. I, I as I'm doing all of this from memory, no notes, <laughs> I, I, I forgot that part. But yeah, she was a protege of Harold Lloyd. She made these films with Russ Meyer, but she also continued to work in B films even after that time with another famous B movie maker, Ted Mickles, who made The Doll Squad, which a lot of people may know because Tarantino references it a lot. We'll talk more about Tarantino <laughs> when we get through the production notes on this. 
She married a couple of times, one being a Los Angeles police officer, and she was a dispatcher for the LAPD. She is the strange matriarch character. Like she had two, at least two daughters. One, I think, is Kalani Silverman, who goes by Lainey Silver. I mean, that's her stage name because she did some work in Ted Mickle's films. And the other, I can't remember, Jade something, Jade... And Jade actually uses the Satana name as her middle name. And interestingly, you can find her on social media. She goes by Tura's Youngest. <laughs> Tura's Youngest is her Twitter handle. And you can see pictures. Both of them had multiple daughters. So at the time that Tura passed away, she had six granddaughters, at least one of whom is a multi-degree black belt in Taekwondo. So and they all live in the desert, like in Nevada and Utah. So you figure that out. I don't know how much of this stuff to believe. I only know what I can find online and what I've heard over the years. There's a lot of question about where the story for this film comes from, but one of the possible influences that some highbrow critics tried to cite for this is that they view Faster Pussycat as a pop art version of Aeschylus's The Eumenides, where the three women are like the three furies avenging the death of Clytemnestra. I am not tempted to go quite that far, but I think that is that is the most extreme feminist interpretation of Faster Pussycat that... I think given the amount of agency that Tura had on the production and the development of the characters, it's hard to argue that there isn't a feminist bent to it when there was so much female creativity that went into the story and into rounding out the characters. Before we get into that, maybe we should tell people kind of what the story is. Yeah, um, story. Story, like it's you know, there's there's um there's not very much plot involved, which I kind of like about this film. It's a very simple mood piece. Um, no, that's 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 a lie. Um, the film was shot in black and white because it was going to save the production money. It cost forty five thousand dollars to produce, and I don't think it didn't make back that 45k but it was considered a commercial and audience failure upon its release perhaps especially compared to motor psycho the film mirrors that plot pretty closely in the sense that it's three characters driving fast and causing mayhem but of course in this story it's about three go-go dancers instead of three troublemaking juvenile boys so the go-go dancers, Varla, Rosie, and Billy, Billy being the fun blonde of the group, <laughs> leave their go-go club to go off and practice their racing skills. They all have their own fast cars. And when they get there, they are met by a teenage girl, Susan Bernard, actress, who was 16 and had her mother present on the set. And the mother apparently caused all sorts of trouble, both for the director and for Tura Satana, because Susan was reportedly actually afraid of Tura offset, like legitimately terrified of her. And it makes some of the subsequent plot elements feel really realistic. Susan, by the way, just passed away uh, about a year and a half ago at the time of this recording. She's notable as being possibly the first ever Jewish playmate in Playboy. She also uh, did some nude posing later on, not at this time because she was still a teenager, but continue. Susan Bernard, good old American girl in a polka dot bikini, shows up with her boyfriend and they are going to do some time trials, you know, in a very civilized, non-competitive, just competing against yourself kind of way. And Varla will have none of this. So she challenges this good old American boyfriend to a race, which ends in fatality, not because the race itself ends in a crash, but because she steals the time trial device, the clock, from teenage Susan Bernard, and uh, a fight ensues with the boyfriend, which ends in 
Varla cracking his spine in the famous, if you look at the poster for the film, you can see a, a buxom strong woman standing over a guy pulling his arms back and stepping on the back of his neck. And that is this famous scene, which sets off the action for the rest of the story which is basically a kidnap escape film with some buried treasure rolled in and a lecherous old man in a wheelchair and a Lenny-like strongman son and then another good old American boy, which <laughs> in my mind kind of mirrors the plot of Motor Psycho pretty well, where there is some sort of good old boy who shows up at the end to try to make things right. I did not see this on the big screen for the first time. I did see Beyond the Valley of the Dolls at the midnight movies on the big screen. But the first time I saw Faster Pussycat Kill Kill was on home video, which is a shame. This is the type of film that's really good on a big screen. It has a lot of desert scenery and things like that. They drive awesome sports cars, a Porsche and MG and a Triumph. The women are all buxom, busty and hourglass figure and again very out of step with the times which was all about androgyny and twiggy was the biggest model at the time and i mentioned nancy sinatra earlier she was also of that you know go-go boots were in they were very people often talk about them as go-go dancers and stuff like that but to me nancy sinatra has never represented a go-go dancer to me <laughs> um, mm -hmm. the women are amazing they are definitely there for their physical performance and their physical endowments more than their acting. <laughs> um, Haji, in particular, her acting in this is really off. She was better in Motor Psycho. It's interesting that this film affected people very profoundly, positively or negatively. And second wave feminists hate this film they <laughs> hate it it was trash left and right um i don't have any quotes i should have prepared some or found some but a lot of the third wave of feminism love this film which is really <laughs> interesting because i don't think there's any really sympathetic female characters in it and then it has profoundly affected film directors so tarantino is a huge fan there was some talk about him doing a remake of this around the mid 2000s. He was talking about it and supposedly was working with Tura Satan on the script. She died a couple of years later. So I'm guessing that's what put an end to that. But we do see, I think, a tribute to it in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where there is one of the Mansonite girls, uh, crazy, again, crazy girl living in the desert, was called Pussycat. Yeah, but also uh, Russ Meyer is thanked explicitly in the credits for Death Proof, which is another fast car girl vigilante film. And it's kind of interesting thinking about Motor Psycho and Faster Pussycat as the two parts of Death Proof, just as a... Yeah, and so Death Proof was Tarantino's half of the film. The other half was... Grindhouse, and the first half was Planet Terror. Planet Terror by... Rodriguez. Ro right? Robert, Ro Robert Rodriguez, yeah. And then in between the two, they had trailers. Yes. <laughs> which was great, because when I watched this, just a plug, this thing's a little hard to find. I found it on the Grindhouse channel on Roku, which has trailers in between it from the period. But they, had, they made new trailers for fictional films that didn't exist, to put between Death Proof and Planet Terror in Grindhouse, one of which was done by Rob Zombie, who is another person who was very influenced by this film and, in fact, cast Tura Satana in some of his video projects. Another person, filmmaker, that was very influenced by this was John Waters, who often c calls it the best film ever made. <laughs> He has even gone on to say, probably the best film that ever will be made. <laughs> <laughs> also, this movie influenced a new generation of burlesque dancers. The new wave of burlesque revival that we're in right now gets a lot of influence from this. Number of, of top burlesque dancers mention it. There's even some that take their dancer names from these characters. One person who has been 
talking about it for years is Dita Von Teese, who is a huge fan of Teresa Tana's. I'm glad you brought up burlesque, because I think in terms of interpreting the film as either a feminist film or something that is entirely driven by the male gaze in which women are objectified horribly and, you know, it's trash. I think thinking about the difference between burlesque and stripping is a helpful lens here. One of the things that makes burlesque a more feminist art form is it has to do with the way women control the gaze. So if you think about when you're watching a burlesque dancer slowly remove a glove one finger at a time, she is showing you where to look. She's showing you where the action is. And yeah, I mean, your eyes could wander, but good luck with that because she's bringing you under her spell where you can't wait to see what she's going to do with that glove. I think this film has more in common with burlesque than it does with stripping. Although the camera angles in the film definitely suggest a very strong male gaze. A lot of the shots are done, if the women are facing you, the camera shoots from above so you can look right down into their chest. And if they if the, they are showing the women from behind, it is shot from below so you have the best view of their ass. So there is definitely an element there. But there are a couple key lines in the film where the characters at least raise your awareness about this or indicate that they have some control over the gaze. One of the most famous lines is a line that Tura inserted into the film herself with the gas station attendant, where his, you know, his eyes like clearly fall right into her cleavage. And she, he's talking about, you know, being a traveler and navigating. And she's like, well, you're not going to find it down there, Columbus. And yeah. One of the best lines in the film. And... I burst out laughing at that. <laughs> like... <laughs> I was so, so psyched for her, but I feel like there are moments like that where it's clear that even though we as the audience have access to look at these women in suggestive ways and to desire them, I never felt like they were out of control at any moment. I always felt like if they were showing me their amazing breasts, it's because they chose to wear those clothes. If they were showing off their legs, it's because they were putting themselves in a position where they wanted to be seen and desired that way. I think Billy, um, the, the fun nympho drunk blonde, is a great example of this character where every line she says is dripping with innuendo. And it's clear that she is coming on to the male characters. She is the sexual aggressor in a lot of those Couldn't scenes. you tell I was a girl? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I, I'm tempted to view this in the burlesque lens of the women have a lot of agency over who sees them how and control over the audience's desire rather than seeing them as purely objectified. I wanted to do my new segment on the show, which is pairings. This is where I suggest or have you suggest what you think a good food and or drink pairing is to go with films, because the way we watch films now is very different, especially during this pandemic. We're watching it on TV. We're watching it in our living rooms. And I don't know about you, but I'm eating or drinking during it, which we normally don't do except for popcorn and candy during regular films in the theater. So you can probably guess what my pairing for this is, but I'll let I'll I'll let you guess it first and then Well, are you drawing uh inspiration from the lunch spread in the film? The fried chicken and the good good old American meal? Yes I am. So I think the best food and drink pairing with this is for food fried chicken well first of all all the action is participated by a game of chicken okay <laughs> and then we later have a scene where there is a fried chicken dinner in particular billy is like gnawing on like chicken left and right symbolic perhaps i'm not sure but this is the perfect movie for that and then i would suggest a american light lager mass produced beer because they're constantly drinking beer. Now, granted, Billy has some cutty sark with dinner, but um, 
but in general they're drinking beer and they're probably i couldn't identify it but it's probably hams would be my guess as to what they're drinking which isn't available anymore so i would recommend maybe the closest you could get today is a pbr or possibly a coors coors is probably so coors beer and fried chicken a bucket of chicken get those together get your friends together watch this on a double bill with motorcycle that's my that that is a evening right there all right and what i'm gonna say is if you run out of beer and you run out of fried chicken because i'm right with you it's like that is course number one then you should move into nachos and tequila shots based on the desert setting of the film and kind of how drunk you want to be by the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I want to talk about the teenage girl character in this film played by Susan Bernard. Uh, the character's name is Linda. When I was watching the film, the portrayal of this character was something I was very focused on and concerned about, just in, in terms of thinking about the film as a feminist film or not feminist film. I was in particular concerned immediately about how young the girl was. And it wasn't until after I looked up the age of the actress that it gave me any clue. What I found interesting is the contempt with which the innocent characters are treated in the film. And my interpretation overall is that she's not really a damsel in distress character. She's not just sent into the film to be a rape victim. She doesn't end up getting raped in the film, but she is threatened several times. First with the much older boyfriend, which I found very concerning. Then with the lecherous old man who tries to snatch at her. And then with the idiot son who ultimately can't bring himself to violate her, but the threat gets very close. I think because her innocence is treated with such contempt and the American good old boyness of her male counterparts in the film are also treated with contempt, that I ultimately came away from the film not feeling like it was misogynistic and that it hated and distrusted women and saw the three main female characters as representing a kind of evil femininity or, you know, a threat of what happens if women have their own agency or what happens if women get to drive or, you know, whatever it might be suggesting. That I came away from the film more with a sense that the film reflects misanthropy rather than misogyny, that it hates everybody and that nobody is a good person in the film. They're all horrible, including this innocent teenage girl whose innocence we are to see as much of a fault as the decadence and slatternly ways of the three main women characters. This is something that is not just in this film. It's in Russ Meyer's films in general, but it's also in exploitation films in general. This is one of the recurring themes of exploitation films, whether it be like I Spit on Your Grave is a perfect example. Usually one character, an innocent character, is tortured and uh, pretty mercilessly throughout the film. There's a lot of torture type stuff. You see a little of that bubble up into mainstream films with stuff like A Clockwork Orange, for example. But it's definitely something that's there and you'll see it in the films by people who were influenced by this. So you'll see it in Tarantino's film to a degree. You'll see it in more, a greater degree in John Waters' films where the innocent girl or guy or, and a lot of times the, he takes it in a different direction with the mainstream American, the, the, the mainstream American is the victim in a lot of his films, and that may be a woman or a man. Kind of a taboo that exploitation film worked on. I think Rob Zombie once described exploitation films as films that showed in Times Square, which was where all the porno theaters were, that you felt kind of dirty after watching. And he wanted to do that with House of a Thousand Corpses. He wanted that kind of a energy brought to it. I think it's not just this film. It's typical of the genre. I wonder in terms of why it has such staying power, why it is seen as so important to the development of cinema in general, is that it draws attention to the voyeuristic act of participating in cinema in general. 
whether you're watching the private pain of a family in a melodrama or you're soaking in the horrors of war, there is something that should feel a little dirty about watching movies and that this film by taking you to all of the places your id wants to go, highlights that truth about cinema in general. Think about the opening narration to this film, okay? It starts with the new kind of female. (laughs) She prowls alone or in packs. Violence, the word and the deed, you know. uh, She could be your secretary or a dancer in a go-go club. There's this, like, (laughs) attempt to make everything extreme right like the, that's like something that's typical of these films but also i think there is also it was a time after world war ii before vietnam when there was a lot of social repression and there was a desire to break out of that we talked about how in cold blood that what really was the birth of the true crime genre in a lot of ways true capote's novel i know there had been a few there had been some written before that but really that's what birthed the genre and reading it there's a titillation aspect to it it wasn't fully talked about you know it's like oh this is so horrible can't wait to read the next page you know <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't until beyond the valley of the dolls the film that he made uh where Roger Ebert was the screenwriter that he actually dabbled in Hollywood. Hollywood tried it and said, yeah, okay, you're too far out there for us. And that was that was the beginning and the end of Russ Meyer's Hollywood career. <laughs> Both fans and filmmakers, the people that this genre attracted were definitely, I think, the misfits of society. You know, after the repression of the 1950s where everything was uniform and you had your two and a half kids and your dog and your white picket fence, that having a film or a genre that is all about lowering your inhibitions and listening to your own voice and what you want and what you're capable of, you know, must have had a ton of appeal. I love the line in this film where Varla says, I never try anything, I just do it. For all you Star Wars fans, echoes of Yoda in the the mouth of Varla. It's very fun. Or echoes of Varla in the mouth of Yoda, as the case may be. (laughs) Yes. No, there were a lot of great lines that I feel kind of point to what exploitation cinema is all about. Billy has one of her many come-ons to the homespun guys out on the ranch in the desert, she says, I'm your cup to fill to overflow. I feel like that kind of captures what exploitation cinema is in a nutshell. Cups overflowing, but also the invitation for you to overflow. Like for you as as a person to just let your id take over. Well, to let my id take over, I'll say there were a lot of overflowing cups in this film. (laughs) Oh, my. It was a really nice change, actually, to see a film where the three women are all full-figured women. Women who are larger than life and bursting out of the screen. Held together with leather belts and, you know, boots and tight pants, but they were allowed to be their full selves, which I thought was great. One of the things I found interesting about this is I walked away from the film feeling like, feeling as dirty as if I had been watching porn. Feeling as if it were as exploitative as that and that it had been showing as much skin and it had been as sexualized and what's amazing is i don't think there's any actual nudity in there's the film. none there's, there's none. no and... exposed breasts there are no exposed nipples there are a couple of shower scenes but first of all they're bo- from behind and they're usually cropped so you see very little the most skin you see is the 16 year old girl in a bathing suit and the go-go dancers in the beginning a little bit but all those shots are cropped so you're only seeing them for a few seconds at a time and often it's just their hips or just their spangly bra shaking. I didn't feel like it was as suggestive as I thought this film would be or thinking about it in retrospect as what I thought I had just seen. And maybe it's the combination of the violence and the sexuality that 
gives me the impression that I have been watching a porn film, which now I'm going to go talk to my shrink about. (laughs) (laughs) All I can say is this movie, if you haven't seen it, go see it, find it, hunt it down somewhere, see it, preferably late at night, preferably on a double bill with Motor Psycho or Mud Honey. You're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. I think this is the kind of film that that there is not a lot of middle ground. (laughs) No. (laughs) And I'll say I loved it. I, yeah. I've been digesting it over the last 24 hours. I have to say my immediate reaction was not, I love that film. It was, oh God, what did I just see? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I was... Followed by, oh yeah, actually this is doing a lot of cool stuff. I really like it. Well, we'll leave it at that. If you're interested in having us cover some more Grindhouse or drive-in type cinema exploitation films, let us know at GC8 Podcast. That's letter G, letter C, number eight, podcast, all one word, at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Eric. And Johanna. Signing off.